speaker's precious time, and we need to have that because the talk will be precious. Welcome. I'm so pleased that you're here today. And for me, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Sharon Bowman, who will give her Society of Counseling Psychology presidential address now. As you are surely aware, Sharon came to this point today because of her excellent background and training in counseling psychology. And through her two decades plus of leadership and service to our society and our profession. Sharon is a PhD recipient from the wonderful institution of Saluki Dogs in Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> a university, by the way, from which her predecessor, and that would be me, also received a doctorate degree about two decades earlier than she did. <laughs> Dr. Bowman completed her internship at the Counseling Center at the University of Delaware and then went forth to do great things, which she has done beautifully. Dr. Bowman used her educational preparation very effectively since receiving her degree and has gone on to serve the people of Indiana, the nation, and indeed the world in both powerful and dynamic ways. She became both a health service provider in psychology and a li licensed mental health counselor in the state of Indiana. With this licensure and certification, she has provided counseling, therapy, consultation services, and leadership in her community and across the state in an ongoing capacity in private practice and by serving the, uh, the state. She is a member and past chair of the Indiana Psychology uh, Board, and she is a member of, of, has been Indiana's liaison to the APA Disaster Response Network. Through her disaster work, she is a longtime disaster mental health volunteer. She fixes them. She doesn't create them. She fixes them. <laughs> and she is an instructor with the American Red Cross, working in local, regional, and national capacities. She has taken graduate students <clears throat> to provide mental disaster mental health services after both Hurricane Katrina and the 2011 Alabama tornadoes. While service to the community has been an integral part of her work, and it's been both impactful and therapeutic, and equally, and perhaps even more profound impact, has been through her academic leadership. She is professor and chair in the Department of Counseling Psychology and Guidance Services at Ball State University. She is also a fellow of the American Psychological Association and Division 17 and 45. Dr. Bowman recently directed the External Interface Board for the Society of Counseling Psychology and served as the division's first emergency response coordinator. Dr. Bowman's research and clinical interests are in supervision, mentoring and training, disaster psychology, and broadly defined issues of diversity. Through this leadership, she has demonstrated her commitment to serving the people and has set leadership standards for service and influence for counseling psychology and within the greater psychology community of the American Psychological Association. She has received numerous awards in her career, and uh, I would be glad to provide you with a list of them later, but I'm not going through them now. It would take about a third of the meeting. So just trust me, she has been well recognized. <laughs> Dr. Bowman has contributed more than 30 refereed articles and book chapters. She's written 100 presentations at national and international gatherings. She's been a reviewer and on the review boards of eight of our major professional journals, and she has been an advisor and mentor to literally dozens of students over the years. Thus, her scholarly and academic contributions have been uh, impactful, profound, and have been influential for all of us. It must be said, though, that while she has been an academic star and a major service provider for years, she has other areas that often fail to appear in the official bios of presenters. This, in the case of Ms. Uh, Dr. Bowman, would have to be include being, without question, the best pie and cake maker in the department. <laughs> <laughs> likely the best at Ball State University and probably one of the best in the whole state of Indiana. Additionally, it is understood from all who have participated in gatherings in which Dr. Bowman was a participant rather than a master of ceremonies that her quilting skills are the envy of all, for she can pull together a sweater faster than the APA Council can consider a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Friends and colleagues, I give you our speaker, President Sharon Bowman. Thank you. I 
hope you still feel the same way when I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for that wonderful introduction. As many of you who have been introduced by someone often find, you sit there and you think, who are they talking about? <laughs> there are aspects of my talk today that are going to sound familiar because, I, and it's been reassuring to me over the last few days that I have heard people talking about the things that I promise you I had already written in my address before I heard you talking about them. So I'm not just stealing things from other people and I was feeling a need to make sure I set that up front. And just bef and before I go on, how many Salukis are in this room? I love my Ball State Cardinals, but I, I just have to check in with the Salukis. Okay. On a Wednesday in late January 2014, can you all hear me in the back? When I hit that point where you can't hear me, please let me know, because I know it'll happen. On Wednesday in late January 2014, as we in Indiana were feeling less than happy about the weather, we'd hit another five or six inches of snow on the ground. Wind chills that would literally freeze a raw egg in minutes. I saw it on the news one afternoon. They did it. I got a call from my program chair, Rosemary Phelps. She was finishing up the 2014 program to submit to APA, and she needed the title of my presidential address by Sunday. This was my face. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to talk about, much less what I was going to call this phantom speech, and this woman wants a title by Sunday. This is yet another surprise that my colleagues did not warn me about. So I told my husband, Martin, my dilemma. He said I should just call it Nelson and be done with it. It's the perfect title, he said. It's noncommittal, yet it's intriguing at the same time. <laughs> I could talk about anything I wanted with a title like Nelson, right? Nelson, you see, is my current dog. I asked Nelson what he thought. He indicated a distinct preference for a snack and a walk, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> So next I turned to Debbie Nolan, SCP's executive director, and I explained my dilemma. Debbie started laughing about the Nelson idea. And then she said, well, why don't you just use your presidential address, title, the theme for the year, make up a title from that. It's like, the woman is a genius. I don't know why I didn't think of it. She did. So there we were. I came up with a title. So that's, that's wonderful. I'm inspired now, but I'm also a little afraid. So at the end of January, that weekend, I started working on the address. I swear, I started working on it. I got the intro done. I got the ending done. I didn't get to the meat of it before the snow melted. And those of you who were in the Midwest know exactly how much snow we had. As have many of you, I've attended a few of these addresses over the years. And it's one thing to sit out there and, and attend the address. It's another thing when you sit out there and you realize, oh, wait a minute. I, I'm going to have to give one of those. It takes on more significance at that point. I remember attending Barry Chung's address, being both enchanted and fearful at the same time, and thinking, oh my goodness. I've got to find out where I am with my slides. Thinking, oh my goodness, is that what I'm supposed to do? Could I back out of it now? <laughs> before things got any further, and somebody got hurt, namely me. <laughs> so afterward, I mentioned my budding trepidation to Andy Horn, who was now president at that time. And I'm thinking, Andy might be feeling the way I'm feeling about this. I didn't know Andy very well then. If I had, I would have perfectly anticipated his response. Andy said, more or less to paraphrase, no, not at all. It's your speech. Each one is different. Of course, it is the most important speech of your professional life. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Andy. Barry later added these encouraging words. It's only the most important speech of your professional life if you don't win the Leona Tyler Award. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. I stopped asking presidents at that point. So I was still on the search about what I was going to say on about this, the most important year of my professional career today. So I did what many of my predecessors have done. I went back and I read the past presidential addresses. 
I also asked my students to tell me which ones they thought were the best, but I read, but went back and I read a lot of them. Unlike graduation speeches, which go in one happy year and out the other, presidential addresses are memorialized in the counseling psychologist. We are a quirky lot, <laughs> residents are. Reading through a number of these addresses in short order really gave me a perspective on how to be profound in very few words. And as Andy had said, in all seriousness, each speech clearly reflects each speaker and the time in which that speech was written. So after all of this reading and thinking and worrying about how this moment was going to go, I came to the address in the same way I always honestly come to my writing. I create 50 different drafts in my head at times when I can't write anything down, like when you're driving. And when the time comes to actually write something, hopefully the words will flow well. So what is about to follow will seem like random thoughts, but I promise it all comes together at the end, or at least it did in my head. So to explain my year, I decided to play with combinations of the theme. So I'm playing with combinations of the words conversation, collaboration, and change. I am because you are. I shall start there. I am here today because my African-American father had the sense to listen to his sister when she told him she had met the perfect woman for him. I am here because my mother, as did many African-Americans in that time period, left Georgia and came to the North, where she met my future aunt and eventually my father. My parents each completed about a year of post high school education, and they raised three children on a mail carrier salary. From that vantage point, they encouraged, actually they expected, their only daughter and oldest child to finish college, not just start, but finish. My sixth grade teacher was a Caucasian man who was teaching in a predominantly black, just overwhelmingly black elementary school in the 60s. And he told my parents I was college material, and they believed him. They didn't care what I chose to major in, as long as I was happy with my choice. Never doubt the power of early influences on a child's life. My parents taught me by example. My mother taught me to listen. She would smile, she would nod, she'd absorb the conversation around her, but it was rare that she ever shared her own responses or reactions. Yes, just like a psychologist. <laughs> my father, taught me to do whatever I wanted to do, even if no one who looked like me, as he would say it, was doing it. As a black man, he knew that he couldn't wait for other people to do something he wanted to do first, because he might be waiting forever to get things done, so he just went and did it. I took that message to heart, and I've had countless experiences because I got tired of waiting for somebody else to do it first. So I am, because my parents collaborated on producing me, they gave me a shove, they sent me out to make my way in a world that doesn't always know what to do with me. I'm also here today because of the academic path I followed and the people who collaborated in guiding and or pushing me down the path. There are many nameless people who put a hand on my back or a foot in my rear, or in some cases they just got out of the way and let me be. For the sake of this address though, I'm only going to reference four of the people who have paved my path. Nancy Betts, who is here today, was my undergraduate advisor at Ohio State. Wasn't even the Ohio State then. <laughs> it is now. She, of course, had lots of undergrad advisees, and trust me, I really didn't stand out in the crowd. I remember sitting in her office from time to time, not knowing what to do, not knowing what a step on my path this woman really was going to be. My master's advisor at Akron was Linda Subich who happened to be one of Nancy's first doctoral advisees. And I was one of Linda's first master's advisees. It's a small world phenomenon, you know? Linda took me in hand, this child who really didn't know anything about acronyms or anything else, and she put me on the path to doctoral school. My doctoral advisor, Tony Tinsley, who is also here today, took me under his wing, and then he gave me a shove toward an academic career. He repeatedly told me that I should teach, and I repeatedly told him that he was crazy. <laughs> I am an introvert, and introverts don't teach. 
Little did I know that most of us are introverts at the time. <laughs> so one afternoon, Tony put me on the phone with Janet Helms, an African-American woman, a pioneering counseling psychologist, a woman who was five states away who I had never met. She happened to call while I was in his office. Janet got on the phone with this child and told me that I had to teach. Even in that brief interaction, I understood you do not argue with Janet Helms. <laughs> I am because people, these people, is the microphone still on? Okay, see, it's not me. I am <laughs> because these people are collaborators and they initiated the movement of my path. I am here finishing this presidential year because some people supported the work I wanted to do and other people got out of the way and they just let me do it. My leadership style, as my colleagues will tell you, is a perfect combination of my parents' approaches. I listen to the environment for some length of time until I get tired or my ears get full, and then I start to organize all the noise around me and I create a map that I can get the group behind. I understood that my charge this year was to move certain things forward with SCP. So to achieve that goal, I have collaborated with lots of people, and in turn, I've initiated all manner of conversation with the goal of change and moving the association forward. I hope that I have done what I was tasked to do. Atlanta 2014. <laughs> if you have been connected to SCP for any more than about four months, you know what my major collaborative project was. If you still need one, I have bookmarks. <laughs> I brought them and I will give them to you. The collaboration around that conference consumed 18 months of my life that I will never get back again. <laughs> Fortunately, it was 18 mostly great months, but it was 18 months of my life. First collaborative experience for Atlanta 2014 occurred when people started jumping on the party bus saying we should have a conference, and then they turned around and invited me to drive that bus. <laughs> I had to quickly decide whether to drive the bus or let them crash. Obviously, I eventually decided to get on the bus and take the driver's seat. CCPTP and ACTA then got on board. We filled the bus with the steering committee and got the planning underway. I, Atlanta would not have happened without that posse of people and without the countless people who shared ideas, time, and effort to bring it all together. Let me tell you, it takes a village to raise a conference. Atlanta brought countless opportunities for collaboration and conversation. Certainly you can imagine the obvious ones with posters, presentations, and symposia. But there were several unexpected pleasures too. The first, when we joined with Georgia State's Cultural Competency Conference, which was happening in Atlanta at about the same time. Instead of overshadowing them with our conference, we were able to join together and create a bigger entity. The second pleasure was landing APA President Nadine Caslow as our keynote speaker. Now Nadine lives in Atlanta, so it's not like she traveled far, I know. And she's not a counseling psychologist, but her ideas resonated with who we are and what we do. It was also a pleasure to watch her give presidential citations to a number of our members and surprise them. We know that we have great talent in this division. It is nice to know that the APA president also knows that we have great talent in this division. Next, for me, was the opportunity to hear the past presidential initiatives. To have my colleagues together, to have those two presentations happen, it was truly a delight to get to hear their perspectives a year, a few years out, on what they had done and why they'd done what they did. Another amazing collaboration, which a number of people in this room participated in, was what we are now calling our mentoring dinners. We all know what happens when we go to convention. I'm sure it's happened with you all here. You go to the socials or the dances, you connect with your friends and long lost colleagues, and then you run off to dinner. There's very little opportunity to really speak to a new student or a new colleague because we just don't have the time. We're busy socializing with our own and we're all introverts. <laughs> so to counter that practice, we invited a few of our seasoned colleagues to choose a topic and choose a restaurant, and then spend a couple of hours in spirited conversation with ECPs, with students, 
with anybody who just wanted to join them for dinner on a Friday night. We were pleasantly surprised that nearly 30 of our colleagues chose to do this. Anne got excited and decided to pair themselves up for the dinners. And all told, we had about 150 people out for dinner doing those mentoring dinners that night. It was a smashing success from everyone, except for a couple of dinners that lasted a really long time. <laughs> but that was fun, it just lasted a long time. I understand that members of some of those groups have remained together post-Atlanta. That is conversation and collaboration at work, without a doubt. Throughout that conference, my vision came alive as conversations sprung up all over the hotel. I was also pleased with the number of mid-year attendees who shared that this was their first conference they'd attended in years, and they were very excited that they were able to be there. I hope we find a way to keep those <coughs> colleagues engaged. The biggest complaint I heard was that there were too many competing events and people couldn't decide which ones to attend. I think that's probably a sign that it's a great conference, though. And finally, there was one other event in Atlanta that followed through with Dr. Caslow's theme of matching art and psychology, and that was our silent option. We have a lot of very talented artists who are counseling psychologists, and that's one of our hidden talents, not counting my pie baking. Thanks to the generosity of these artists and your generosity in buying and paying for items, bid early, bid often, bid high, we raised over $1,300, which the ECP group was able to use for travel to this conference. I could go on and on and on about the lessons of Atlanta, but suffice to say that we accomplished what we set out to do. We created a space and a place for people to get together, and they took over from there. I am also excited to report, if you have not already heard, that SCP will be holding the seventh conference in 2020. So one of you out there, whoever's going to be president, just know you have a conference in your future. <laughs> In case you never saw our, our paperweights, it's, that's, that's a peach. You may not be able to catch it in the picture. In my free time, and I have had a little, I heard about a few other collaborations or conversations this year. I've made you aware of them via the SCP and the SAS listservs and our newsletters. I realize that for some of you, you know me very, very well from emails but may not recognize my face, so I've been able to pass you in the hallway because you didn't know who this woman was. This is a good time for me to mention an exchange that I had with John Westerfeld a few months ago. He emailed me a question late on a Friday afternoon to which I responded 30 seconds later. He responded, not for the first time, that he was amazed at my ability to be so on top of my email. My response was this. I am tied Whoops, went too far. I am tied to this email via IB. I have two laptops, an iPad, and an iPhone. So being without one or more of them at my side is impossible. I can't walk a block without pulling out my iPhone to check for messages. I think I may deserve the latest iPhone for all of this work. So if you wonder how it is that you hear from me so often, it's because I'm attached by IV. In fact, some of the respondents to the recent SCP communication survey commented with appreciation for my regular communications with the membership. And now you know how I do it. I am anticipating my iPhone 6, by the way. <laughs> Primary among the year's conversations was APA's drastic change in the distribution of divisional versus central office programming. While we had been told that changes were coming, we didn't know how those changes would affect us. In fall of 2013, we learned that we were going to lose 25% of our programming hours for APA 2014. At that point, the cabinet and the program chair had to make some fast decisions about how to handle our programming model. Our decisions would not only affect APA 2014, but they would also affect the stage for 2015 because we anticipate losing more hours. Those internal conversations led us to publicly and strongly encourage collaboration, both across divisions to take advantage of the central office collaborative programming model and interdivisionally to more effectively use our remaining allotted slots. Our ability to quickly and effectively communicate these changes to the membership was vital in getting collaborative programming submitted and thus exposing SCP's work to a wider APA audience. 
conversations and collaborations help us be flexible in times of change. Other conversations about change or the need for change prompted me to create several special task forces or stigs whose work will continue into my past presidential year. I don't have time to go into significant detail about them here, so I'm going to briefly mention each of them. The Disaster Mental Health Group, David Romano, who is SCP's Emergency Response Coordinator, has taken charge of my other pet project. Disaster Mental Health has been close to my heart since 1996 when I attended my first critical incident debriefing in relation to a fatal fire in which two children under the age of 10 died. My charge to David was to help me increase awareness of disaster mental health among the membership of SCP. Easy, right? My attention this year has been divided, and this topic has not been given the focus it deserved. In my absence, however, David has been busy. He's offered a dis Foundations of Disaster Mental Health course in Atlanta, along with a well-received workshop on crisis work on college campuses. His task force met physically in Atlanta and since then via conference call, and among other activities, they are planning a survey of the SCP membership. The visibility and interactiveness of our convention programming STIG, just coming up with the title, took us uh, countless emails. Dom Scalise and Joe Hammer spearheaded a group to help bring us more fully into the social media era. Their charge was to increase our ways to promote SCP's amazing work at convention, while also gaining more immediate feedback on our offerings. I hope you've taken time to view some of those really amazing and very funny YouTube videos that were promoting SCP symposia and business meetings, you know, some of those emails that you were getting. And that those of you with, sm with phones that are smart enough to have scanners have actually used it to provide us with feedback post-session. I look forward to more great ideas coming from that particular group. My third stick is the awards and recognition stick. SCP, as you know, believes in giving awards and recognition when they are due, and we want to give those awards to the most deserving people. As a division, the breadth and the depth of who we are and what we do has evolved over time, but we have not necessarily updated our descriptions of our awards to keep up with who we are now. On the advice and with the input of the executive board, the past presidents, and the awards and recognition co-chairs, I invited Tanya Israel, Linda Forrest, Bill Parham, Louise Dows, Joida Hansen, and Mary O'Leary Riley, just imagine being on those conference calls, to work on this project for me. They began with the most prestigious of our awards, the Le Leona Tyler Award, which is given in the name of an amazing woman who was both SCP and APA president. It will now be known as the Leona Tyler Award for Lifetime Achievement in Counseling Psychology, with a description and a criteria that clearly reflects the breadth of our contributions across the profession. That committee is to be commended for their thoughtfulness that they put into this task in a very short period of time. I have a tendency to come up with stigs sort of late in the game and say, hey, can you do this for me? And they did. So they still have work to do but they've done major work on this one. And I've lost my mic again. But somehow I think you can hear me. After all my years as an educator, this is my 26th year of teaching, so it is all my years as an educator. I have observed all manner of changes in our educational process. Today's students have different needs, Expectations of faculty have shifted drastically, and university administrations are more likely than ever to question our purpose. As a result, several conversations related to education have arisen in the past year. The first one, counseling psychology versus clinical psychology, is not about the internship crisis. As an aside, can something really be still called a crisis when it's been going on this long? Shouldn't there be another word for what that is? I, I don't know what word that would be, but there should be another word. I'm actually referring to something else. The SAS representatives have been repeatedly sharing with us that a discrepancy exists between the upper limit of student loans available for counseling psychology students versus that available for clinical psychology students. The upper limit for most, for most graduate students is just over $138,000. 
but clinical psychology students have a much higher upper limit. I believe this is related to the exaggerated linkage between clinical psychology and the medical field. I have to tell you this is a hard one for me. On the one hand, I want to champion the right for our counseling psychology students to receive the money they need to complete their degrees. So the idea of raising those limits makes perfect sense to me. However, that's tempered by the idea that anybody should have to borrow that kind of money to get their degrees. That money should go to buying a house, raising a child, taking a trip around the world. It's disturbing to me, and I see it's disturbing to a few other people in this room. Current students who are still borrowing money, and our ECPs who are beginning to get those big student loan bills, they all understand those scary numbers. Those of us who have been out of school a little while longer, we don't tend to think about it the same way. It's sort of akin to faculty choosing textbooks for classes, and we really don't know how much those textbooks cost, and the students are looking at us going, do we really need that $300 textbook? I don't have an answer for that discrepancy, and I don't know if there is one, but I really do believe the conversations have to continue if we're going to try to find a resolution. My second educational conversation is one that began before my presidential year, and it will continue on into the next presidential year. And that is the ongoing focus on master's level training and licensure and the ripple that it creates throughout counseling psychology. I will not rehash that topic here. We do not have time. However, conversations and collaborations are occurring on three fronts. First, CCPTP deserves incredible credit for their continued focus on this issue and its lasting effect on our training programs. Please do not underestimate the amount of energy that's being expressed on this particular topic. Second, and here was a surprise for me, our students are so concerned about the topic that independently they're also looking at ways that they can help, ways that they can discuss this, and wanting to be involved in the discussions and in the search for finding a solution. The future is here and they walk amongst us. Again, do not assume that our students are not paying attention because they certainly are. The third conversation on this topic is very early in the making and it's also a bit of a surprise. If we are going to move forward regarding training, we need to be talking to our colleagues all across the counseling professions about what's going on and what's happening. We are beginning to do that. I'm pleased to say that overtures are being made, and I look forward to more of them. I look forward to what I hope will become a collaborative effort to affect change. We all will benefit as a result of those conversations and collaborations. There are some significant life events that are always a catalyst for change, whether we like it or not. I refer in this instance to birth and death. My presidential year began with a birth. Literally, as I was in transit from Indiana to Hawaii, I received a text from one of my current advisees that he was at the hospital awaiting the birth of his first child a daughter. Her mother is also a soon to be graduate of our doctoral program. I don't think this mic likes me. <laughs> this particular advisee was a member of the 2013 Leadership Academy, so his daughter's birth was the main topic of conversation an ocean away by all of his newfound friends. If you saw the Atlanta promotional video, you saw my future advisee because she literally was the star of the video. One of my other advisees also became a first-time father that summer, so you see both of my future advisees in this picture. <laughs> Babies are good omens, I think. The flip side of birth, however, is death, which we also faced this year. In January, I learned of the passing of one of my first doctoral advisees. I had a master's advisee die a few years ago, but this was my first doctoral advisee. His death was as painful as losing a biological child. We are not prepared to bury our children. Lonnie Duncan's loss was not just my own. 
His passing was a shock to his family, a shock to his Western Michigan family where he taught, and it was a loss to SCP in no small part because he was co-chair of the Awards and Recognitions Committee at the time that he died. I cannot tell Lonnie's stories today because Lonnie is not here to retaliate with stories about me <laughs> or to laugh his great Lonnie laugh. Those of you who know him know what I'm talking about. I will only say this. Lonnie told me he was rooting against my winning the presidency because he knew that I would put him to work. <laughs> and obviously he was right. The conversations held on various listservs in the aftermath of his passing serve as one more, more reminder that we do not know how many people we touch or how often our unsung efforts make the difference in someone else's life. More on that in just a few minutes. Other deaths occurred this year, stimulating yet other conversations. SCP lost two past presidents that I know of. We also lost Bill Stilwell, who created and managed our listservs for so many years. These three will be memorialized in the business meeting in the next hour. And although she was not a counseling psychologist, the work of many people in this room was shaped by Sandra Bim, she of the research on gender roles. Her life work and her death both occurred on her terms. And if you don't know how she died, you really should look it up. As I learned of these deaths this year, I reflected on what I might have learned from each of those people's existence, on what is then important in my own life, and what I wish my own legacy to be. So really, really, seriously, as my students will tell you, that I say all the time, seriously, <laughs> what has changed? I have rambled on about the randomness of this year, about what has shaped me personally and professionally to get me to this place. I didn't save the world this year. I'm good, but I'm not that good. But I didn't set out to do that. At each point that I've spoken, the commonality has been that someone threw out an idea or saw a problem, someone else listened, and did something about it. Someone thought I should run for president, and I listened eventually, and I should back up. Someone thought that I should teach. <laughs> I'm looking at Tony now. And I listened eventually. Someone thought it was time for the next counseling psychology conference, and I listened eventually. In Atlanta, and through the various committees and task forces I initiated this year, I created opportunities for others to start conversations, which may in turn lead to collaborations, and I can only hope to change eventually. You know how things sometimes happen for a reason? I was searching for the ending to this speech, and I came upon snippets of a TED Talk. I heard it playing in the background, and it stopped me in my tracks. TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Their ideas worth spreading. Basically, they invite people to take about 18 minutes to share the essence of their idea with the audience. If you don't know TED Talks, please get on their webpage and check it out because they are incredible. This particular talk was by Drew Dudley, who is not a psychologist, but he was talking about leadership and influence. And the relevant part for me is that he was talking about what he calls lollipop moments. Lollipop moments. It's that moment when two people have an interaction that may be insignificant to one of those people, but to the other person it's life-changing and profound. And it's just a lollipop moment. The death of someone in my personal and professional life usually stirs me to think about such moments in my relationship with that person. And once in a while, someone will share such a lollipop moment with me, one that I don't quite recall, but frankly, when they share them with me, I'm not surprised that I allegedly said or did whatever they tell me I said or did. I shared with them with you about Janet. I end here by encouraging each of you, and there are lollipops back there, I encourage each of you to continue the theme of my presidential year by sharing a lollipop moment with someone who's had an effect on your life. Tell them they don't necessarily know. 
you will likely find, as I have, that the other person has no idea about the impact of that little moment. But the sharing will stimulate conversation, and who knows where the conversation will lead. Can I go backwards? So I've got to do the usual thank yous, right? There are three categories of thanks that I need to do. First, my family thank yous. I've already told you about my parents, who are the foundation for my existence, and who kept me on goal until I finished school. My father retired about a month before I graduated with my doctoral degree. He wanted to make sure that he was working until I was done in case I needed something. My parents, I think, were a bit relieved to turn over guard duty of me to my husband, Martin, who has spent the last 23 years trying to keep me grounded when I needed it and being my sounding board for my scheme of the day, of the week, of the month. One of me is more than enough for the world, as I say often, and trying to manage one of me is more than enough for the world. So I appreciate everything that my family and that my husband have done to keep me sort of in line. The second set of thank yous go to my extended academic family. I've been in school since I was four and a half. I do not know any other life. I do not understand how people go on vacation in October because I don't know how you do that. It's, it's the middle of the, you can't do that. You know, finals, midterms, stuff, I don't know. I don't know any other life. My advisors, Nancy Betts, Linda Subich, and Tony Tinsley, each had a hand in getting me through Ohio State, Akron, and Carbondale. As I said in my fellow's address some years back, with that lineage, is it any wonder that I started out in vocational psychology? Where else was I going to be? Over the years, there have been numerous peers who have shaped my path, my path, including my past and my present colleagues at Ball State, many of whom are here today, who have given me the freedom to do things that I never ever thought I would be able to do. They have, I appreciate everything they've done for me. I appreciate them allowing me to do this today. I have also given the evil eye to more than a few advisees in my time, many of whom are also here today. It's often given with a smirk. It's generally deserved. And it's mostly, yes it is generally deserved. <laughs> Don't make me look at you. <laughs> Mostly because I know that they could do better than they were doing. And I am truly proud of each and every one of them. And I say it now publicly and it's on video, so you know I said it. And I have been department chair, this is now my 19th year. Yes, and I'm still standing. <laughs> I have had the encouragement of two deans, neither of whom were counseling psychologists both of whom let me do just what I wanted to do and what I needed to do. I'm sure you're beginning to see the theme here on how things work with me. <laughs> and finally, my professional brothers and sisters, never randomly say to the president, you will serve at the pleasure of the president, unless you really mean it. There are people in this room who learned that lesson. I have a memory like an elephant. Oh, you said that? Hey, we need to talk. When I issued an invitation to serve an SCP on an SCP committee, a special task group, a chair position, or whatever I asked for, most of you agreed without blinking twice. I thank you ever so much for your service. You have granted me the opportunity to work with Tanya, Barry, Andy, Michael, and Jim, the recent past and future presidents, along with lifetime membership in the exclusive club of SCP presidents. <laughs> the past presidents have cheered me on for the past year whenever I needed advice or words of wisdom. And last, but certainly not least, Debbie Nolan and Skylar Simonovsky have been my co-conspirators for the past year. I really couldn't have done this without their counsel, their wisdom, their reminder texts, and their patience with me because I send 3 a.m. emails. And with yeah. Many people know I send 3 a.m. emails. I am legendary. 
but their reminder text to keep me in line. I will end here. I am because you are. Without you, I would not, I could not be standing here today. In short, this has been Mr. Toad's wild ride. I became president-elect-elect elect in Orlando, and that would be an Orlando thing. I would not trade this for the world. Thank you for giving me the ticket to ride.